towards the end of chapter uh, 7 into chapter 8, it says, well, if we're going to have, have a new priest, we need a new law uh, because the old law requires the old priest. And then it begins to say, well, uh, if uh, we have a new law, then everything changes and we would just say we have a new covenant. And uh, so he begins to say, hey, Hebrew nation, there really is a need for a new covenant because he says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. Uh, but the first covenant, of course, wasn't faultless. And uh, the, the reason it wasn't faultless is because uh, it, it uh, couldn't provide ultimate salvation. It could bridge a gap. Uh, and yet, even in bridging that gap, there was the need for the people to remain faithful, and the people didn't remain faithful. So, in verse 8, it says, uh, King James says, finding fault with them. We talked about that last week. I really think that should be finding fault with it. Uh, this is finding fault with the first covenant. He said to them. So, finding fault with the first covenant, he said to the people, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, that's what we talked about last week, this new covenant. And uh, uh, my, uh, my, my belief and conviction, uh, based really on this passage of Scripture, which is uh, quoted from the book of Jeremiah, that you and I are not under the new covenant. We're not under the old covenant. We're not under the new covenant. But you and I are under a grace, uh, or to, uh, that is very true, but uh, to be uh, uh, more specific to this chapter, we're under Christ. Uh, we're under Christ, who is the middleman, you remember, we talked about, and we'll bring that up again. Uh, so if he's really the middleman, then uh, he's between the old covenant and the new covenant, and we're not in the old covenant, we're not in the new covenant, so we need a middleman. And Christ is our middleman between those, those uh, two. Uh, and he goes on in verse 9 to say, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day. He's talking about the new covenant. It won't be like the, the covenant with the fathers in that day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because uh, they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, uh, saith the Lord. It would uh, be interesting sometime. We're not going to do it in this study. But uh, take that little phrase, I regarded them not. And follow that through. You say, wait a, wait a minute. Uh, God, did, uh, God disregarded the Jewish people. And uh, actually he did. And he did it according to the covenant. Uh, because the covenant, uh, the old covenant had restrictions. And that is the Jewish people had to do their part. They had to be obedient. And if they didn't do their part, what was God going to do? Turn his back on them. Uh, he would disregard them. And... So uh, he said, I regarded them not. Uh, by the way, just a little uh, footnote on personal Bible study. I think I mentioned the other day, though it may have been on the online Bible study, I've forgotten, uh, that when I study the Bible, I use uh, three things. Uh, there's actually four. But uh, the three things I use are the King James Version of the Bible. I use uh, the Newberry Interlinear Translation of the Greek uh, and uh, compare those two. And... Uh, then I use a Strong's Concordance. Those are the three things uh, that uh, are uh, so important. Uh, for you, I'll let you buy with two of them. You can use a King James and a Strong's Concordance. Uh, but if you really want to be advanced, go ahead and do the uh, Newberry Interlinear. Uh, be careful on buying your interlinears, by the way, because most of them are built on a different text. That's why you need the Newberry Interlinear. Now... Those three things I use. But there is a fourth one that I very often use, and this is readily available online, as all of those are, by the way. You can uh, look at any of those free online. Uh, but the fourth one is called the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. And what the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge does is uh, take each verse of the Bible. Uh, so you would look up Hebrews chapter 8 verse 9 in this, uh, in this uh, context and it will give a little phrase from the King James. If you don't use the King James it gets a little confusing because the phraseology is different and you can't match it up as well. But it will give this little phrase like, I regarded them not. And then it has a string of Bible verses. And uh, those Bible verses uh, prove the point that I regarded them not. They're illustrations. Now you say, what's the difference between that and a concordance? A concordance, like Strong's Concordance, all that does is look up the particular word. Uh, so it may or may not be in context. The Treasury of Scripture Knowledge 
uh, looks through and finds every place the Bible says, I regarded them not. Uh, and this, by the way, was done in the late 1800s by R.A. Torrey. And I just look at this and say, how in the world did anybody without the aid of a computer ever go through and uh, give these, this uh, exhaustive uh, reference that, that uh, gives you... Uh, all these uh, all these occurrences of that kind of a context, and uh, so often when I stand up here and sound real smart, and I uh, I say uh, you know this uh, reminds me of when God did such and such, and I give a uh, an obscure illustration from the Old Testament, and you say he really knows his Bible. Actually, I have a treasury of scripture knowledge, and I looked it up, and <laughs> it gave me those. So I would sound so smart when I stand in front of you. Not really supposed to give away all the secrets, are you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, people are walking, standing up and leaving. and uh, uh, But really with those four things, you can do all the Bible study uh, that, uh, that, that you need and not, uh, not get uh, messed up by somebody else's opinion. The treasury of scripture knowledge is the closest one that has somebody else's opinion, uh, but it's still just going to lead you to another Bible verse, uh, and it doesn't have any notes or anything with that, and you'll be able to look that up. So, uh, anyway, uh, he, he did. He turned his back upon them. Now, this is part of the fault of the Old Covenant. The fault of the Old Covenant was it required, uh, I might say, perfection of man, and yet man was never perfect. It required the perfection of the, of the Hebrew fathers, as in the context here, and the Hebrew fathers were continually turning away. So, he says, I need a new covenant, a different kind of covenant. Verse 10 says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for all shall know me uh, from the least to the greatest I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins and, in, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now all of that is a quote from Jeremiah chapter 31, and that is the description of the new covenant. So when you see all that come to fruition, you can say, I'm in the new covenant. Until then, you're going to have to say, I'm not in the old covenant, and I'm not in the new covenant, so I must be under Christ, the middleman. Uh, between the covenants. Verse 13 of chapter 8 says, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And this is part of, of course, his argument uh, to the Hebrews is they need, it's time to move on. So then uh, we come into uh, chapter 9, and we're going to look, I believe the top of your outline says verse 1 through 10, and the actual outline has verses 1 through 14, and I'll tell you in about 30 minutes uh, how far we actually go. Uh, but uh, let's look at verse 1. It says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Uh, here is the, uh, uh, he, he's going to continue really this thought. That's why I gave you so much uh, review, is he's continuing this thought of the new covenant. So, uh, then, that's a word in the past, verily, truly, uh, no doubt about this, he says the first. Now, in uh, King James, it has the word covenant in italics, which, of course, remem you remember, means that that word was inserted by the translators. It was not there. Uh, this is one of the reasons, by the way, I don't recommend the English Standard Version or the Holman Christian Standard Bible or the NIV for a number of other reasons. But uh, if you have any of those versions and you look, it'll say the first covenant, but the word covenant is not italicized. So you can't tell that that was put in by man and not by God. Uh, and I think you need to be able to tell. Uh, here, actually, maybe it does mean the first covenant. Uh, the Newberry Interlinear, and I haven't uh, dug through this to figure out why the King James didn't carry it through, but the Newberry Interlinear linear Greek version actually says the first tabernacle had ordinances. Now, uh, is it the first tabernacle that had ordinances or the first, uh, uh, first covenant that had ordinances? The answer is Yes. Uh, and the first tabernacle was under the first covenant. So in a sense there, it's not really going uh, to change anything. But we are, we are biblical engineers, and engineers are precise, right? Uh, so we want to check all these things out. So uh, the first is literally what the text says. The first had also 
ordinances, but not just ordinances. These were ordinances of divine service. We're going to look at that word uh, later on uh, in uh, verse uh, 6 and, and come back to it. Just remember those words, divine service. So there were ordinances of divine service. That is, there were things under the first covenant that especially the priest, but the people and the priest were supposed to do, right? Uh, and of course, it wouldn't be hard to figure out some of those things. You're supposed to bring your uh, sacrifices at certain times of the year, and they were, uh, the priests were supposed to bring sacrifices at certain times of the day even, and all of this uh, was carried out and is uh, enumerated in the first covenant of uh, the, the law. Read the first five books of Leviticus and you'll see a lot of it, first five chapters. Uh, so it had these ordinances of, of divine service and it had a worldly sanctuary. No doubt about it, uh, the instruction under the first covenant, under the law, was a worldly sanctuary, right? We call it the tabernacle. And here's all the details, as we talked about last week, of how to build the tabernacle. So that's the first one. Uh, verse uh, 2 then says, For there was a tabernacle made. The, f the, the first wherein was the candlestick. Now, uh, we have to be careful here because this gets a little confusing. Uh, there was a tabernacle made. It says the first wherein was a candlestick. Now jump to verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of holies, uh, holiest of all. If you're not careful, you will uh, say the first tabernacle and the second tabernacle. And uh, you might be thinking, well, there's no second tabernacle, so it must be talking about the temple. But actually, uh, it's only talking about one tabernacle here. So let me explain the, uh, the English here. Uh, for verse 2, there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein there was a candlestick. Do you remember the uh, design of the tabernacle? You would go in to the, the first room. That's right. That's the first that it's talking about here. It's talking about the first room of the tabernacle, not the first tabernacle. Uh, it was the first tabernacle also, but it, here it's really talking about the first room. Well, after you went into the first room uh, or within the first room, there was the menorah, there was the table of showbread, there was the altar of incense that we'll talk about in a moment. And then there was a veil, uh, and beyond the veil was what? The Holy of Holies. And only the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, and then only once a year. And within the Holy of Holies, there was the... Ark of the Covenant. So some of that will be mentioned here in just a moment. So when he says here the first, he is referring to the first room in the tabernacle. Now the second room in the tabernacle was called the Holy of Holies or the holiest of them all here. What was the first room called? The secretary's office. <laughs> yes. Did you say they... The holy place, that's right. So this can get kind of confusing because you've got the holy place and the holiest of all. Uh, you've got the holy place and the holy of holies. Uh, and so the holy place is the first room. And the, the Le Levitical priests could go in the first room uh, and uh, carry out their uh, particular duty. Uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, perhaps was in this room. Maybe even Zechariah, uh, the father of John the Baptist, was in the holy of holies, uh, carrying out uh, his duty by lot because uh, they had left much of the first covenant by the time John the Baptist was born. Uh, but uh, this is the, what was taking place. So, uh, in the, the, the first room, the holy place, in verse 2, it says, Wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, the showbread is not called the sanctuary. The first room is called the sanctuary or the holy place. And there in the first room was the candlestick, or we might call it the, the menorah. Uh, the, that uh, would, the menorah would be the Hebrew word. And uh, it uh, was the uh, uh, seven-branched menorah, three on either side and the one in the middle. And uh, that was in there. And uh, that was only in the tabernacle, by the way. In the, uh, in the temple, later on in the temple, Solomon, when he built the temple, actually put 12 menorah. He put one for each of... Uh, uh, of the tribes. But in the original, there was the one, uh, one menorah and the table and the showbread. The showbread went on the table. Uh, the showbread uh, that went on the table, there were uh, 12 loaves that went on, one for each tribe, onto this table. And they were changed out. Does anybody remember how often? Not every day. Uh, once a week. <laughs> they were uh, changed out. Uh, 
on, um, I wouldn't plan on talking about this, so I didn't look it up. It's either, uh, it's either the Sabbath or the day after the Sabbath, which would be the first day of the week. Uh, most Christian theologians say the showbread is representative of Christ. You remember he came and said, I am the bread of life. Uh, the showbread, by the way, was leavened bread, not unleavened bread, uh, and uh, carries out uh, the uh, picture of fullness that, uh, that God offered unto them. And so not only was it changed out, but actually the Levitical priests, when they went in to change it out, they consumed the old bread uh, and uh, brought in uh, some of the new bread. Uh, and some, I think, of our, even our, uh, uh, what we have in the Lord's Supper carries, uh, uh, got its founding there in the showbread. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the showbread, you know, honestly, uh, the showbread was just bread, right? Uh, the priest made it and they dedicated it unto him and it represented the Lord and they consumed it, but they didn't get the Lord by eating the bread. And so you have to be careful to, not to carry some things over that don't need to be carried over. So here's the uh, showbread in this room uh, called the sanctuary. Now, uh, in verse 3 it says, And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies. Uh, excuse me, the holiest of all. I'm so used to calling it Holy of Holies that uh, I can't even read. Uh, now, after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Uh, the... The, 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 he's using the terminology again, the first tabernacle and the second tabernacle. But that is the first room, the second room. We would call it one tabernacle in our way of speaking. Uh, so after the second veil, again, you have the holiest of all. Uh, now, uh, I, I want to, I, I got to get into Greek to help you understand uh, what this says. Uh, in verse 3, it says, after the second veil. Okay, if we talk about after the second veil, then would we be talking about inside or outside of the second veil? In, in having gone through, right? Uh, and uh, so on the inside of the Holy of Holies. Uh, the problem is, verse 3, verse 4 says, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the problem is, you can't find anywhere in the Old Testament uh, Hebrew Scriptures where it talks about the golden censer, that is the altar of incense, uh, being within the Holy of Holies. It's always in the holy place, not in the Holy of Holies. So why does this say it's in the Ho Holy of Holies? Truth is, it doesn't really say that. Uh, it uh, just appears to say that in Greek, and excuse me, in English especially. Uh, the Greek word uh, meta, uh, Anyone know what that means in English or uh, the prefix meta? It comes a lot like uh, metamorphosis and uh, me meta. Ah, thank you. I, 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 when DNA is changing, what would you call that, doctor? Metaphase. Metaphase. Uh, so meta really is the word change, is, is the word changing. Uh, and... Uh, I don't know, metaphysics, uh, I guess, I don't, know, I don't know what that means. Uh, but, but any meta word is going to have a change kind of concept. Now, uh, when you take that in verse 3, uh, changing to the second veil. doesn't really say going through the second veil or after the second veil, but it's meta. And many, many times actually in the, in the New Testament when the word meta is translated, it's actually translated using the English word with with. Uh, the idea, it's used in Greek in this, in, in this uh, sense, saying, uh, now we've talked about this, let's change and talk about this. So it's not, a, it's not the kind of change as, uh, it, it's, it's more of a, a, a turn of the, of the conversation than anything. So we've talked about the first tabernacle, and now I want to change and talk about the second tabernacle, but He's, he uses this, let's, let's translate it, with the second veil is the golden censer and then the altar of incense. Now, I'm convinced when you look at this theologically, and we're not going to get any deeper than this because I'll get lost and you will too. But uh, theologically, the, the, uh, the, the altar of incense goes with the, uh, uh, the, the second veil 
And you have a, a theological progression here as you've got the light of the world, the bread of the world, and then you've got this mediator uh, that uh, is also representative of Christ and the, uh, the, the, the prayers that he offers uh, for the saints uh, and that altar of incense that's pictured there. And that is along with going into the Holy of Holies and that which is there. So uh, tie those two things together. Uh, so with, with and literally, literally it was right there. If the curtain is right here, then these plants right down here are the, uh, that's the altar of incense. So with the second veil, you have the altar, uh, you have the uh, golden censer as it's called here. And just on the other side of that, of course, is the uh, Ark of the Covenant. That is the one that Indiana Jones was looking for and is now stored in a government vault. Uh, but uh, you have this Ark of the Covenant uh, round about, uh, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna. Here's uh, where in the scripture we find out what's, what's in this Ark of the Covenant. The golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Now the golden pot that had manna, we understand that. They took some manna for a remembrance and they put it in uh, this golden pot. And it's within the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Aaron's rod that budded. Anybody remember why Aaron's rod budded? To validate, uh, that's right, uh, to, to validate his, uh, his ministry as the high priest because there were others coming along saying, uh, like in the days of Korah, you remember, uh, there were others coming and saying, no, we, we, we're all priests. Now, in our day, uh, my, my rod's not going to bud, right, uh, and, and give me validation. If it would, then I would use scriptures like, uh, do not touch God's anointed whenever you disagree with me. Uh, and if you ever came and, and began to argue with me on something or say, I disagree or you're wrong on this, I, thou shalt not touch God's anointed. And I'd lay my rod out there and it would bud and you would back off and the earth would swallow you up. Now, those are like in a preacher's dream. Uh, that's how the world works. Uh, but I'm not Aaron, uh, the high priest. Uh, you, you look at it later with, uh, with the prophetic ministry. The same thing is given as well when uh, Miriam and, uh, and uh, Aaron go up against Moses and say, we hear from God too. And God says, oh yeah, I, I talk to Moses like I talk to a friend face to face. You, on the other hand, leprosy. <laughs> so that's what you get. Uh, and uh, God it was so clear that there is a priest and only one, and I've selected him, and you are to follow him. There is a prophet and only one, and I've selected him, and you are to follow him. So uh, in the days of Korah, they were coming up and saying, no, uh, they were arguing basically for something that we preach today, and that is the priesthood of the believer. And they were saying, we can all go before God. And uh, we can all represent ourselves before him. And uh, God uh, said, uh, let's, uh, said, said through Moses, let's have, a, let's have a test here. And they took their, their rod and they laid them all down. And uh, Aaron's rod just immediately budded and produced fruit. And the fruit was? Almonds. You got it right. You win the award today. Uh, and the fruit was almonds. So it, uh, it budded and had almonds. By the way... Uh, were there any almonds represented in the uh, holy place? What was that? Probably. That's a good answer. <laughs> and yes, there were. And if you were to walk into the holy, holy place to find the almonds, where might you look? <laughs> Go to the menorah. And the menorah, each, uh, uh, each one of the, uh, the, the, I don't know what you call it, branches of the menorah had, uh, I believe it was three almond blossoms, and then the top, the bowl, was, in the, was an almond, uh, in the shape of an almond, and it had the oil in it and the, and the wick then coming out. Uh, so this, this idea of the almonds somehow is, is uh, carried through here. Now, that rod that budded is still there. Brings up the question, what is the manna today? Is the manna still good and the rod still blooming? Uh, we'll have to ask Indiana, Indiana Jones for sure. Uh, truth is, we don't know, but I don't have any reason to believe that uh, if God wants those preserved, that he can't preserve them. And uh, the ark itself, even, uh, being preserved uh, somewhere who knows where. So these two things. And then the third thing are the tables of the covenant. Now, the tables of the covenant are what? The, the Ten Commandments, yes. Uh, so 
This helps us to see that the Ten Commandments really are the representation not only of the law, but of the Old Covenant. Uh, there's so much more to it than just the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, but these tables of the covenant that Moses uh, <coughs> uh, brought down and uh, then later had to re redo uh, are contained in there. Now, I think this is accurate, the tables of the covenant. Uh, I, I have shocked some people before by saying, and I'll go ahead and remind you of the shock, uh, by saying that you and I are not under the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are of the Old Covenant. And the Old Covenant uh, is uh, something that, uh, you know, we don't want to try to put ourselves under. Uh, now, that sounds almost uh, heretical to say we're not under the Ten Commandments because, after all, we, uh, um, we got all up in arms when they said take the Ten Commandments down off the wall, you know, and, and, and we got uh, upset about it. Uh, I do believe we have a Judeo-Christian culture, by the way, and uh, Judeo-Christian culture, by and large, is uh, built upon even the Ten Commandments. Uh, but, uh, and, and I also believe that you should not murder or commit adultery or steal or uh, bear false witness or uh, covet, uh, even uh, use the name of the Lord in vain, or uh, uh, put, uh, put uh, some other God before our God, the one true God. You shouldn't do any of those things. Uh, but what about remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? Well, I didn't, did any of you work yesterday? Okay, Sabbath breaker, Ten Commandment breaker, Old Covenant breaker. Yes, you are all of the above. And, and all of us are all of the above as well. And the Seventh-day Adventists are still Sabbath breakers, by the way. All they did was change their service time. Uh, and that doesn't get you under, under the, uh, the, all the instructions of the Sabbath. Ask any good Jew and they'll say, no, that, that ain't going to cut it. Just to uh, switch and have your service time on a different day. Uh, so we're not under all that old covenant. Uh, is, is there stuff in the, in the old covenant that very much applies to us today? Yes, but let's find it. Let's, let's find that in a different place than under the old covenant. And, and, and the problem is, is you've got this, uh, 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 let's, what, what shall I say here? You're, uh, you're proving more than you want to prove. If you say we're under the Ten Commandments, then you come here and say, well, the Ten Commandments are the tables of the covenant. Well, I guess we're under the covenant. And uh, then all of a sudden you get all the law that we're under. And it's very easy to see. We wouldn't have to go very far to find examples in the uh, modern, even evangelical church where there is just over and over again the attempt to put us back under the law. And we do all that. The sermon on that is right after we sang, free from the law, oh happy condition. <laughs> uh, I just think we ought to say, free from the law, oh happy condition. Jesus is bled and there, there is remission. Bruised by the fall and cleansed. Uh, we haven't sung that in a long time, Rodney. Like probably 60 years. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, not 60 because I'm only 51. So. Uh, so here's what's in there. Now going on to verse 5. It says, and over it, this is over the ark, the cherubims of, gl of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Uh, we're in the Holy of Holies. Here's the Ark of the Covenant. Over the Ark of the Covenant are, in King James it says what? Cherubims. Why is that incorrect? Uh, no, I think you said because there's just one? That's, uh, that's not right either. What does is, what is your translation say? The cherubim of glory. The cherubim of glory. Okay, that one got it right. King James did not get it right. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's a, a good point, but that's not what I was referring to. <laughs> uh, actually, what I'm referring to is the S on the end of cherubim. Uh, cherubim is a foreign word. It's a Hebrew word, and it is plural all in itself. Cherubim is a plural word, so you don't need to put an S on the end of a plural word. You were close. Yes, you were so close, Robin. <laughs> uh, so it, it, if, you want to be, if you want to be good he Hebrew students, uh, over it, the cherubim of glory. Now, that is more than one, and there are two there, uh, if you go back into the Old Testament. So two cherubim. Of course, a cherub, singular, is a what? It's a, it's, 
It's an angel, that's right. Uh, you, you've seen the picture and you think it's a baby angel, uh, but uh, it's actually just an angel. There's no such thing as a baby angel except in the pictures. But uh, uh, a, uh, they, they were angels that had a particular role, and uh, it is the role of uh, surrounding and honoring the Lord and worshiping Him. So here are two cherubs, would be proper to put an S on that if you want to do it, but uh, really cherubim of glory. And they are shadowing the mercy seat. That is, they are over, their wings are overstretched, and uh, they, they, their, their shadow then comes down upon the mercy seat. The mercy seat is the, the lid, if you will, of the top of, of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and it was on the mercy seat that once a year the high priest would come in and he would take the blood of the uh, sacrifice and he would sprinkle it onto the mercy seat. Later on, by the way, it, uh, it, it comes that Christ is our mercy seat. In fact, uh, the uh, particular Greek word here uh, is hilasteron, but uh, it is the same word that when it is used in a verb sense in the New Testament is called propitiation. So Christ is our mercy seat. He is our propitiation. He is the one uh, that uh, is not just the blood of the atonement. That blood just came and was sprinkled on the mercy seat. But he is the mercy seat himself. Uh, and he is the propitiation. And he says then, of which we cannot uh, now speak particularly. I, <laughs> I would like to know why he can't speak particularly. I would like him to speak particularly of this. I, my hunch, and I, I, I don't know the answer to this, and you don't either, because it doesn't say why he can't speak of it. Uh, my hunch is not that he doesn't know about it, but that it doesn't pertain to the argument at hand. And so I'm not going to go there because it would take you know, 19 sessions to get through chapter 9, uh, if I covered everything. <laughs> uh, so he says, we're going to move on. Verse 6, now, when these things were thus ordained, um, let's see, I think I, speaking of moving on, I think I skipped one thing. Um, no, here we are in verse 6. Okay, when, uh, when these things, that is these things that we just talked about, obviously, were thus ordained, that says back in the days of Moses, Moses, the priests went always into the first tabernacle. The priests, plural, went into the first tabernacle, which really is talking about the holy, of, the, the holy place. The, the priests always went in there, and they did every day. And there in the holy place, the first room of the tabernacle, they were accomplishing the what? The service of God. And uh, it has in italics uh, of God. And uh, the reason is the uh, particular word that is used here uh, is uh, the word uh, latreia. And it is a word that, it, that, that means service, but it's only used in the context of serving God. So in verse 1, it is called divine service. In verse 6, it is called the service of God. Uh, and uh, we don't ha really have an English equivalent of this word. When we talk about service, it could be, uh, you know, just service uh, for humanity or service for the pansy club or service of God. It's all the same. Uh, but they, the Greeks had this particular word, which was a divine kind of service. So the priests always went into the first tabernacle, verse 7, or the first room of the tabernacle, verse 7, but unto the second, that is the Holy of Holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Uh, here, he, uh, the, the, in, in, into the holy place, as you have seen, we've talked about this already, he goes once a year to the mercy seat, puts the blood, and this blood is for himself because he himself is a sinner, which is why uh, a new priest after the order of Melchizedek is going to be better. But he offers uh, uh, for himself, and then it says also for the errors of the people. Uh, look in your Bible, especially if you don't have a King James, and uh, tell me what words are used there in addition or uh, other than errors the sins of the people okay Any, anybody else have a word besides errors of the people the sins committed in ignorance okay uh, let's talk about those three and then I'll tell you which one got it right here uh, errors and sins 
we probably uh, would say there's a difference between, in the English language, between an error and a sin, isn't there? Uh, between a, oops, I messed up, and I sinned. Uh, and if you have a child who has uh, uh, broken one of the rules, and he, he won't come out and say, I did what was wrong, but rather... You know, it was an accident that I got my hand in the cookie jar, you know, what, and I didn't mean to. Uh, are you satisfied with your child if he just uh, kind of puts it off as uh, circumstantial? No, you want him to own it, right? So in English, we'd say there's a difference between an error and a sin. Uh, now, uh, I believe it's the New American Standard says a sin committed in ignorance now, we do commit sins in ignorance sometimes, right? Uh, and uh, especially under the law, it was much easier to commit sins in ignorance uh, because there were all these regulations. Uh, if you go by the rabbi, 613 of them. And how do you remember those 613 and check the list every time before you act, right? So you might commit a sin against the law in ignorance. Now, actually... The uh, particular Greek word that is used here is a word that is a, uh, a, 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 a agnoma is the word, uh, and uh, we get agnostic uh, comes out of this word, and an, an agnostic is different from an atheist. An atheist says there is no God, an agnostic says what? It's unknown whether there's a God, that's right. So this agnomia word is... is uh, is the idea of, of ignorance, I don't know, error. Uh, so literally on the, on the Day of Atonement, uh, the high priest was going in to cover the sins of ignorance. And if you look at, I've given you some passages there in the, in the outline, uh, you can look those up. And those are really the sins that, were rec that, that, uh, that could be atoned for, is sins of ignorance. What about willful sins? Truth is the law didn't have... Uh, any kind of atonement for a willful sin. So, uh, it, uh, it had an atonement for, uh, you know, for our, you accidentally killed your neighbor's ox. Uh, you, you, there, there was atonement for that. Uh, but what if you just went out and killed your neighbor's ox because it was barking in the night? I don't know if neighbor's oxes bark, but <laughs> I mean, you did it willfully. Well, there, there is not then, under those circumstances, any kind of atonement. Now, does that mean that if you have done a sin willfully under the Old Covenant, that you are going to, uh, I'm going to use some New Testament, New Testament terminology, uh, or New Testament testinology, uh, <laughs> and that is, you know, would you just die and go to hell? If you committed a sin willfully, not necessarily. Uh, because what the law had is, ignorantly you commit a sin, there's a sacrifice and an atonement for that. Willfully you commit a sin, there's a punishment for that. And it depended on what the sin was as to what the punishment was. Uh, so uh, once you had paid the punishment for it, so to speak, you made restitution, then that sin was taken care of. So you were not uh, doubly accounted for those sins, so to speak. Uh, and, and there were certain sins that resulted in death, of course, and there's no way to, uh, to live on after that. Uh, but this is the, uh, uh, the uh, status. That was a brilliant statement, though, wasn't it? Uh, this is the status, then, of the Day of Atonement was for these sins committed in uh, ignorance. So of the three there, errors, sins, or sins committed in, in, in ignorance, actually, sins committed in the ignorance is the most accurate. Uh, sin... Sing by itself doesn't really explain the full uh, sense of the word. Error is close if you, if you understand all the, you just need a little footnote uh, to it. Uh, verse 8 uh, says, The Holy Ghost signifying that the way, <coughs> excuse me, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. That's uh, plenty confusing, isn't it? Uh, as long as 
the uh, first tabernacle. It says, as it was yet standing. Uh, I think it's better to look at that as it had a standing. As long as the first tabernacle has a standing, that is uh, the outer tabernacle, the, uh, the, the holy place, the first room in the tabernacle, as long as that still has a standing, uh, that is, as long as those things in there are still valid, that is, as long as the menorah still represents Christ and the showbread still represents Christ and the altar of incense still represents represents Christ, as long as you've got those things representing Christ, then you don't really have Christ. But what happens when you, when you go beyond that which signifies something to the real thing? Does anyone want to go back to the, to the, to the previous thing? I grew up in the age in which uh, the United States government told us that we were supposed to eat uh, um, hydrogenized plastic with yellow food covering and uh, call it butter. Uh, and so I grew up eating margarine. Well, a number of years ago, I decided I am old enough now and uh, I have a job and I can buy butter if I want to buy butter. And so I bought butter and I realized butter tastes different than margarine. It actually has a flavor to it. And uh, so I buy butter. Now, I don't want to go back to margarine uh, because I've got the real thing. The other thing signified butter, but it wasn't butter. Uh, some of it was even called something along those lines. Uh, and here, along the same thing, as long as you give some standing to margarine, then you won't go to butter. But once you put aside all that old, 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 old stuff and say, butter, you're never going back, right? Uh, and th this is uh, probably a very cheap illustration to, to uh, uh, give the picture of as long as you've got the, the value of the menorah and the uh, showbread and the altar of incense and those, uh, the work of the priest, as long as you give value to that, then why switch and, and uh, go to anything else? So he's saying, the, pull the rug out from under that thing. Don't give that standing anymore. Uh, so the Holy Ghost signifying that the way into the holiest was not yet made manifest. And, and it's true, it j just really in a, in a, a very simple uh, uh, matter, those Levitical priests had no way to go into the Holy of Holies, I mean, without dying. Uh, so how's the way, what is the pathway for every... Uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry, as I like to say, someday I'm going to come up with a Hebrew uh, equivalent. Uh, what's the avenue for every Tom, Dick, and Harry to get into the Holy of Holies? Uh, for everyone to be there. That way had not yet been made manifest. Hadn't been made known. And yet, what's going to happen at the cross? To the veil. It's going to be ripped in two. Uh, signifying again, now there's access. Now the way in has been manifest. But under the old covenant, it was not made manifest. Uh, verse 9, uh, which was a figure for a time present. Uh, I tell you what, it's 1030 and I don't have time to go into verse 9 uh, because uh, it is, uh, we've got some uh, grammatical issues uh, here that we'll take uh, care of. But this, this old uh, tabernacle, was a figure or a parable for a time present in which were offered gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to conscience. Uh, we'll move into that uh, next week and pick up right there in uh, verse 9 and uh, look at then Christ who comes as our high priest, not by the blood of uh, bulls and goats, but by his own blood, and uh, he gives the sanctification of the soul, all on his uh, journey of convincing the Hebrew people that uh, Christ was the answer. Well, that concludes Bible study.